Let's get it, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the bullpen. Victoria Snitsart, Churchill commentator, back again. Victoria, good day, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be back on with you again, Dr. Ritchie. All right, great to have you back. We're going to talk about what a Trump presidency may look like and also what a Trump nomination, which is now heir apparent in the Republican primary, looks like. We saw the State of the Union yesterday. We also saw the Republican response to the State of the Union, um, dubbed one of the most horrible responses in history. I want to know what you believe, what you think about these items. If you would provide that info and I would then opine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what we're seeing with the nominating contest now with it being pretty much over, uh, you know, Trump had just about a sweep of Super Tuesday. I believe there's one state he didn't win. It was uh, Vermont, and then obviously the DC result in favor of Haley a week ago. Um, you know, she she ran a, a fairly decent campaign, and she did set a lot of records for Republican and conservative women. And, you know, next time we get a candidate of her caliber, they will definitely be running uh, kind of on, on her shoulders. And she definitely broke a lot of barriers um, for Republican women. And so I, I want to do commend uh, former Ambassador Haley for that. You know, I've looked up to her uh, career and I've studied it quite closely from her time in the governor's mansion in South Carolina to her work in the Trump administration, um, you know, working alongside, but also kind of in a Slightly uh, combative nature with Trump. You know, she covered that in her book that she didn't uh, bowl over uh, to some criticisms that she may have had even when she was working in his administration. And I think she's run a good race. Um, but, you know, I do think it's interesting that she has not necessarily endorsed Trump now that she has suspended her campaign. Uh, she said that, you know, despite the, the pledge that she signed when she was participating in the debates to support the uh, Republican nominee. She has not gone out and done that. And I think, um, you know, really, if she wants to maybe be a candidate again in 2028 or even further on, uh, I do think that is something that a bunch of Republicans are expecting her to do um, now that she is no longer in the race. Yeah. So uh, do you think Trump would have endorsed her? He did not sign the pledge to do so. And I think exactly. that. Yes, and I think that um, you know his lack of participation in the debates. I think that was one of the reasons why was that he was not willing to sign the loyalty pledge. No, he said he wasn't going to sign it anyway. Period. He signed it last time, but he said he wasn't going to sign it this time. The reason why I bring that to your attention is because, and I've seen the rhetoric about Haley signing a pledge that means nothing; it's not an actual uh, binding pledge. That they will hold Haley accountable to a do nothing pledge, but not hold Trump accountable for flat out saying, I'm not signing the damn thing and I won't endorse whoever becomes the nominee. If you can hold her accountable to the endorsement of the political party known as the Republican Party, but then give Trump, who's the front runner, a pass, I find that to be hypocritical, do you not? Again, I think it would be hypocritical if he had signed, you know, if the tables actually had turned and he was the one that was no longer in the race and she was, but, you know, he freely uh, did not sign the pledge. Um, and, you know, the, this, this criticism that you bring up, this was something that Haley herself actually kind of flipped back on to members of the media over the past week or so is, you know, ask me if I'm going to support him when you ask him the same question. Right. And again, you know, this is a question that has been pervasive throughout the Republican nominating contest. And, uh, you know, I think he was probably confident enough in his position as a front runner uh, saying that really the situation that we see playing out in front of us right now, that, that was what was going to end up anyways. So I think really he saw this as an issue that he would never have had to address. And if that was kind of the bet that he hedged, I think he was completely right in taking that because he is now the presumptive nominee. You know, that's really interesting. So when he does become um, the nominee officially, which you know I think is going to happen. Some people are still saying he could be negotiated out based on, based on these hearings. I think the Supreme Court has cleared the way for him to be on the ballot, regardless of what actually happens legally to him. But when he becomes a nominee, if he becomes a nominee of the Republican primary, naturally a vice presidential pick 
is going to be paramount in the decision that he has to make. One of the first major ones after being the nominee and sometimes before the official nomination takes place. Is there a pathway in your opinion? You said you look up to our former governor Nikki Haley. Is there a pathway in your mind for her to become the vice presidential pick of, of, of uh, uh, Trump? You know, I think at this point, they both kind of threw a lot of blows at each other. And so I don't know if that relationship can necessarily be repaired in time for November. Um, And I also don't really know if she would want that. You know, she said multiple times throughout the campaign that she wasn't running to be vice president. Now, again, obviously, now that she's out of the race, that might change. But you know, there were lots of people in the Republican uh, kind of sphere of influence that were saying, you know, the debates that we saw, for example, these were going to be vice presidential debates. Yeah, uh, right. You know, Haley Victoria, don't you find it? On that rhetoric, and I don't, rhetoric. I don't mean to interrupt. We, we just have limited time. But don't you find it to be equally hypocritical, if not more, if Nikki Haley actually does endorse Donald Trump? And I say that in this context. Remember, Nikki Haley told us that Donald Trump is actually unhinged uh, and more unhinged now than he has ever been. It was Nikki Haley who said that Donald Trump is a divider and cannot unite the party nor the country. It was Nikki Haley who said Donald Trump himself has dementia and is on mental decline and does not have the capacity to be president of the United States. If you can say all of that about Donald Trump and still endorse Donald Trump for president of the United States, that says to me, You care much more about your own proximity to power than the people who would be adversely affected by the leadership you are supporting. I mean, I think if those criticisms that she applied to Trump can also be applied to Joe Biden, which is, I think, kind of the lens that a lot of the American people are going to be looking at. But that's why she's not supporting Joe Biden. She said some very similar things about Joe Biden, but she clearly is not supporting him. She's telling other people not to support him, but she's saying very similar things about Trump, even more so against Trump when she says he's unhinged. She didn't call Biden unhinged. She said he has mental decline. So. You have Nikki Haley being congruent in her messaging against Biden and then separating the messaging as it relates to Donald Trump. Yes, we do. And again, I think that that's a kind of question that's going to be in a lot of minds of voters. And so I think that if she does make that endorsement, I think she will be asked why now and what again, if there are so many similarities between Trump and Biden, why is she going with Trump? Of course, that answer is going to be that they are of the same political party. I mean, that is just the nature of a two party. But isn't that system. horrible? Isn't it bad? If you believe a person and, and I want us to get outside of the, the very fixed construct known as the political party system. And let's talk about it from the aspect of nature, which is people, right? You vote for You vote for people. You vote for people and you hope those people carry your policy. So at the end of the day, you really voted for policies. If you really believe a person does not have the capacity to deliver your policies, why are you then turning around saying, but I still have to support them? Well, that, that becomes tribal and nothing else. There's no substance to that. that. That simply tells me you are much more loyal to an idea of power than the idea of transformation or even advocacy for the people who look up to you. You said you look up to Nikki Haley. If you look up to Nikki Haley, it is it is because she has done some things in her personal and professional life to provide leadership that you agree with. Then when a person does things that are obviously hypocritical to that leadership, how do you respect and look up to that? Well, I think that the way that a lot of Republicans are going to approach thinking about this election is that, look, for example, just in the federal government, right? As you and I both know, when a president assumes power, he has over 4,000 individuals that he gets to pick as political appointees to serve alongside him and to carry out and to implement ideas that Republicans and conservatives stand behind and agree on. And so I think really what we're going to see here is again, once again, the debate of ideas, because we know both of these two personalities very, very well. And so what we've also seen is that Joe Biden's ideas have not been carried out. And therefore, the natural choice is going to be to support what Donald Trump is saying and to invest in an opportunity for this country to turn around the disastrous governance that we've seen over the past three years. And so again, I think when the American people, including Nikki Haley herself, are going to be faced with that duality of choice. And again, you had kind of mentioned, yes, this isn't necessarily about personalities. It's about the policies. And for me, it is about the policies. And I think that it is, again, 
what we saw in 2016, where a lot of people did not like Donald Trump, but they believed in his policies and they believed in what his policies could do for the future what, of the country. What policies? What well, policies? for me, again, as we've talked about here, as you know, immigration is an issue that's very personal to me. It's one that I would like to but see. But he didn't fix it as he promised. He did not build a wall to, to separate individuals as he promised. He did not get Mexico to pay him the money as he promised. So what policies are we talking about? Well, as we've talked about again before on this show, he did start to build the wall and actually Joe Biden first halted the construction of the wall and then he actually resumed it because he realized that it was such a good idea. But, and this, but wait a minute, yeah. Democrats have built more wall than Republicans. This whole wall debate as if Democrats were against the wall is, is fantasy. Uh, Obama built some wall under his leadership too. Trump built some wall under his leadership. Biden has built some wall under his leadership. What has Trump done? What has he delivered that's a unique pass, a package to the conservative? Because when you look at it pound for pound, you made less money under Donald Trump unless you were in the top 1%. If you were African American, you made about $800 less per household median income. You had less home ownership under Donald Trump. You had a lower high school graduation rate. You also had a defunding of federal trio programs, upward bound educational talent search. These are for first year college students. All of these things declined. Hell, Meals on Wheels declined for our senior citizens. You look at it point by point, agriculture declined. These subsidies for farmers in the United States of America were declined because he decided to wage a tariff war with China. And who got hurt? Farmers did. So what policies are we talking about, Madam? Sure, let's take farming for example. Ethanol was an industry that he invested very heavily in. I personally worked in Iowa in 2019 and 2020, and I know hundreds of farmers that were very grateful for the work that and investment that President Trump had in the agriculture community, just in that state, for example. Another great example, you know, you bring up wages and home ownership. Personally, I actually make about $20,000 more than I did three or four years ago. But I will also tell you that that money does not go nearly as far. And so when you look at things like taking out a mortgage, things like taking out a mortgage were a lot more of a real real possibility for me about two and a half, three years ago. And now with the climbing in, in excuse me, now with the climbing interest rates, that house payment that I was looking at making close to $2,000 a month is now $3,000 a month. And so to replicate that change in interest rate, my salary now has to be $30,000 more than it was, not $20,000 more. And so that's what happens in times of inflation is that even though your raw dollar amount is higher, I it cannot purchase inflation. nearly as many things. Right, I definitely understand inflation. I, I, I hope you understand inflation. What year are you talking about? Talking about 2019 and 2020 before the start of the pandemic. 2019 and 2020. 2019 and 2020 is when your dollar had less impact. Is that what you're saying? No, my dollar, even though I have more actual dollars today, that dollar does not go nearly as far and you need more dollars to acquire the same amount of things. Right. But I'm asking when, did, as when did, the, did then? Yes. So my question is, when did the inflation start to hit you? I would say again, when interest rates started skyrocketing, I got married in 2022. That's when we were looking at getting a mortgage about $2,000 a month, that same house, 400 to $450,000, which by the way, is a starter home in this general area where I live in Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's not a starter home in the majority of the country. So you started to feel, you started to feel the impact, what year? 2022. 2021-2022, correct? Yes. Okay. What year was Biden elected? 2020, and he took office in 2021. Correct, which means the law of economy cannot permeate within that cycle of time to create inflation. Your math does not add up. Inflation would have had to pre-exist 2021. The catalyst of it would have to start before that year in order for it to be realized in the economic markets as they permeate through cost, demand, surplus, etc. So you just blame Donald Trump for inflation. I don't know if you realize that. Well, I I don't agree with your logic there because it doesn't make sense to me. Because I know, it make sense. as do millions of Americans, that their lives were easier under Donald Trump and they've gotten harder <laughs> under Joe Biden. Well, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. We, you just gave me your math. You told me inflation hit you in 2021. Oh, Biden did not occupy office until 2021. You don't see the math? 
it's it's a simple addition here. In order for no, I said 2022 and 2023. So there was an no, entire year plus no, of Biden's no, ma'am, policies. No, ma'am. I, I I have your own recording, madam. I could just you want me to replay it? Go ahead. You started to feel the impact. What year? 2022. 2021-2022, correct? Yes. You said 2021, 2022. You only changed the narrative when I pointed out the hypocrisy in your proclamation. But let's go to the State of the Union response by way of the Republican Party. There's a Karen who's parading as a US Senator who gave the response to the State of the Union. Trump thought it was a great response. Trump followers said it was horrible. What say you? I want to say two things. First of all, I think that the pick that the Republicans made with Senator Katie Britt of Alabama, she was a good pick. She's exactly, she represents exactly the kind of demographic and the kind of voter that they need to be targeting to really get and hope. Wait a minute, what election? She, she represents the kind of demographic, Karens? I don't, I believe that that, uh, I believe that that statement is quite racially divisive and charged. Karen? No, no, no. Karen's coming in all shapes and sizes and colors, madam. Uh, but she's a Karen for sure. You don't think she's a Karen? I don't. I think that she is a very accomplished young woman who a lot of women around the country look up to. And they also see parallels with themselves. Now, mm-hmm. do I wish that her delivery would have been a little bit better? Sure. Personally, I think that she was a little bit over rehearsed, which is why the video itself, I think, came out a little bit awkward. Um, but I think that the choice of individual to have the message was good. And I think that the message itself was good. And so I think that yeah. where she could have done a little bit better was the delivery. But see, delivery matters significantly because the idea is to connect. When you have those speeches, you're not trying to sound like the smartest. You don't need to be the loudest. You need to be the person that connects the message to those receiving it. And that part was obviously not executed well based on commentary from Republicans. Naturally, Democrats are going to say it's BS no matter what. But even conservatives, literally on Truth Social, when you look at Donald Trump's post when he says it's great, his own followers are saying, were we looking at the same response? Because that was horrible. It was one of the worst we've ever had. And I think there's this delusion inside of MAGA that uh, some will obviously say, "Oh yeah, absolutely great job. Delivery could have been better. No, delivery was so bad, it did not meet the moment of the response. This is the response to the State of the Union. And, and I, I'm okay with it because I think it makes you all look horrible in the conservative ideology, uh, ideology race. But it also shows that there's this significant disconnect between, between what people in the MAGA camp say or, or, or would proclaim as, as a good speech or good policy to what actually does happen in real life. I think the speech could have definitely been better for sure, but it was inauthentic. And that's the reason it did not land. What say you? Again, as I just said, and again, feel free to replay this because apparently we're doing this today. I think the delivery could have been better. and. I also want to point to the message itself. I think okay. that Senator Britt's message was a lot better than what we heard from Joe Biden. Joe Biden. What was her message? Time. To me, the message is that we need to focus on American families that are hurting in this time. And that's not what Joe Biden talked about. Joe Biden talked about a vendettive political agenda, and that's what he's going to take into his second term versus what Senator Britt talked about was, you know, she was literally sitting at a kitchen table. She wants to talk about kitchen table issues. She wants to talk about food prices growing up. What about the people that don't have kitchen tables, madam? What about folks that don't have a kitchen table? Well, I don't think Joe Biden was speaking to them either. No, no, I'm talking about Miss uh, the Senator. Yes. What about people who do not have a kitchen table? Then they need to work more and get one because still they can achieve the American dream. I personally have worked three or four jobs for the majority of my life. This is this past year is going to be the first year that I've filed my taxes with one W-2. So I know what it's like to be in between jobs. Look, I work political campaigns. It's not a very stable industry. I know what it's like to be in between jobs and have to pick up three or four to make ends meet. Right. I've been there. Now, now policy, so have- right, policy dictates much of this. Do you not agree that policy is a contributing factor to the quality of life we experience in this country? 
I do. Absolutely. And that's why I get frustrated to no end when policies are implemented to give people a handout instead of a hand up. Can I explain one thing to you? I'm here in front of you because of a policy. So when I was um, 17 years of age, there was a policy known as the First Offenders Act. I made a dumb mistake as a kid and I was facing 22 years in prison because in Georgia, a 17 year old was considered an adult by way of Republican policy. There was a Democratic district attorney named J. Tom Morgan. J. Tom Morgan did not like the state law, so he created a local policy that said any 17 year old who gets caught up in this foolish law will get first offender status, so they will not be a convicted felon. And so I was able to take advantage of that first offender act, which was a policy. And then I was able through that program to apply and take the GED at no cost because of another policy that was Democratic led and Republican opposed. And then the third policy was called the Federal TRIO program or what many know as Upward Bound. It allowed me to take my SATs and apply for colleges without having to pay the fees associated with that. They paid those fees. Once again, that was a federal program that was opposed by Republicans, supported by Democrats. Those three programs are policies. Those policies were not handouts, madam, they were investments. My mother, my father, my grandmother, my grandfather, and the list goes on paid into those programs so that I can have a chance to be here talking to you. So those programs, in all due respect, are not handouts, all right? I appreciate you being on the show, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.